keynote tonight uh, is, is talking about elevating our minds, right? And which is a very thinly veiled way to say, we're going to talk about pornography. Um, now, there's a little bit of an inclination to, like, make this a really funny talk. Uh, and we might get to some moments that are kind of funny. And because I love, the thing I love about our faith is, is the truth and the love. Uh, but I also love the joy in our faith. And I believe there is joy even in some topics that are very, very heavy. And with that, I just want to note that this is a very heavy topic. Talking about pornography is, is talking not just about something that is, is in our society and something that, that we encounter and that we struggle with. But we're talking about lives. We're talking about real struggles and real sin that people wrestle with, that people are harmed by, that people are enslaved to, and that people as a community, as the body of Christ, whether this is something that you actively struggle with or not, this is something that affects each and every one of us. And so I just want to just, just kind of pass through, just to, to recognize that and, and, and just say that, you know, I recognize we're going to have a little bit of fun, hopefully, in this in this next bit of time. But this is something that is, is really very, very, um, it's just important. It's important because this is about who we are. Right? This is about the fundamentals of, of who we are as children, as sons and daughters of God. And, and so that's kind of where we're going we're gonna to go with this. Um, throughout the course of this talk, I'm going to pull heavily from uh, a really excellent, excellent speaker. Uh, he speaks here on the conference circuit with Steubenville University. We're really, really blessed to have him as a member of our team. Uh, he's not here this weekend, but uh, Matt Frad is an excellent, yeah. And he's done, he's done just a tremendous, tremendous amount of work to, to speak about pornography and to speak about um, about the, the reality, the truth about pornography, and also to offer people hope and ways out of their addictions and of their struggles. Uh, for this Lent, how many of you gave up something good for Lent? Make some noise if you got a good Lent that you gave. This Lent, this Lent, I, uh, I'm like a radio, jo I love listening to radio, like talk, I just want people to talk to me all the time. And uh, this Lent, I gave up listening to, like, the news or anything on, on my talk radio, and I went 100% listening to the Integrity Restored podcast, uh, which is Matt Frad's, um, it's Integrity Restored, it's this ministry that is specific to pornography and helping people be free from pornography. Uh, so as preparation for this talk, I spent 40 days listening to these Integrity Restored uh, pornography podcasts. Uh, and the wonderful thing about this is that when you, when you start to get into the research and the study and the content around this, this topic, uh, it gets super exciting, right? And so I would drive into work. I work in a parish, right? I'm a youth minister, and I, I drive into work, and we've got um, all these wonderful, you know, middle-aged women and stuff that, that work in our office. And I would walk in, and, like, I'd be like, I just heard the most amazing thing. And they're like, oh, really? Sure, you tell me about it. And I'd be like... It's about pornography. <laughs> and they would all just be like, whoa, <laughs> okay. Um, but I think that's one of the beautiful things about truth. That's one of the beautiful things about our faith is that when you, when you discover something that's true, when you discover something that really resonates deep down inside of who you are, there's something that just makes you want to share that. And so I'm really, really excited that we have this opportunity this afternoon to discuss um, this topic because it's, it's so, so cool. Uh, I'm going to start out with the quote from, from St. John Paul II, Pope John Paul II, had this just amazing, amazing line that gets to the fundamentals about why pornography is harmful. And I love the way he phrases it because he phrases it in a way that's really surprising to people. So we're going to put up that very first slide. It says, the problem with pornography is not that we see too much of a person. I mean, the whole point, like the whole reason that people look at pornography is like, they're naked people. And Pope John Paul II says this, the, the problem is not that we see too much of a person, but that we see too little. What does he mean by that? Like, sure, you see, like, you know, all parts of a, of a given person, you know, and completely new whatever in pornographic material. But you are completely missing a view of, of the reality of who that person is, far more than just a naked person on a screen. But that is a person who is a daughter or a son 
not only of God, but a daughter or a son of a family. They are a brother or a sister. They are maybe a mom or a dad. They have a history and a past. They are a person. They have a soul. And the problem with pornography is that we take away the dignity and the value of each person and we reduce them from being a living, breathing human person and we just replace them with being an object, a means to an end, someone that is just there to serve our desire. And that's what John Paul II is talking about. The problem is not that we see too much of a person. It's that we don't see enough. We don't see their soul. We don't see their heart. We don't spend the time to value them. And that is a problem. Some of you might be thinking like, oh, geez, seriously, like a porn talk? Really? Like, I didn't want to come to like a Jesus camp to hear about like, you know, why I shouldn't watch porn. Uh, but here's the thing. A lot of people think that because, because like pornography is a problem, like, oh, the church just hates sex. Like, you just don't like sex. You just think like nudity is bad and naked people are bad and stuff like that. No, no, no. 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 Quite the opposite. Right? In, in um, sex is, is wonderful. The church, the way the church looks at sexuality and looks at our bodies and looks at the expression of sexuality is that it is, it is most definitely a good. It is most definitely a wonderful thing. Right? Sex is good. It's so good. If, if it weren't good, then you wouldn't be able to pervert it. Right? Sex, sex is beautiful. Because if it wasn't beautiful in the eyes of the church, then you couldn't make it ugly. Right? You, like, like, look at mud. This is a thing that Matt Fraz says. Like, look at mud. You can't make mud ugly. Mud is mud. Right? Sex is this beautiful thing. This amazing good that can be completely turned and turned and made ugly. Right? The church holds, holds love and sexuality as, as one of the most beautiful things. Indeed, the very first commandment that God extends to humanity, the very first thing that happens in, in in the first chapter of Genesis, um, chapter 28, or in the, uh, yeah, cha- uh, the, the, Genesis 1, 28, God tells humanity, he says, go forth, be fruitful, and multiply, right? That's the first command that God gives to, to humanity, is go forth, be fruitful, and multiply. He's not talking about, like, go grow bananas and pull out your TI-89, right? Right? He's saying, no, go and, and produce. Go and, and, and use your sexuality to populate the earth. This is a good. This is, there's a gift that I've given you. Um, now, some of you might be sitting there and thinking like, well, this is not something that I struggle with. Right? And if you do not struggle with porn, praise God. If you don't feel that temptation, if it's something that you've never encountered, whether you are a guy or a girl, I want to tell you that you are not abnormal for not having been tempted into pornography. Um, But I praise God for the fact that you haven't had that struggle. That's a beautiful thing. However, we live in a culture that is so severely inundated with the images and the effects of a pornographic uh, influence that it does affect you. You may not realize it right now, the way that pornography affects you, but it does. We're going to talk about some of those ways that pornography does affect us. You know, there's like, there's been a a funny, um, there's been a funny progression of the way that we have looked at bodies. And you can kind of see the way that that we we like slowly get used to, um, we get used to and we get accustomed to seeing things, right? And so like, I'm going to skip ahead in my talk a little bit here. there's a section that I want to talk about called Boiling the Cultural Frog. Okay? Uh, how many of you have ever heard the story about, uh, about a frog in hot water? Raise your hand if you're familiar with this. So the idea is this, is that uh, if you take a frog, right, and you put it in some water, right, the frog's just like, cool. And if you put, like, a fire underneath the frog, right, and the water starts to heat up a little bit, like, the, the frog doesn't notice that it's getting warmer. Like, the frog's just like a happy little frog. It's just, like, kind of kicking it there and just like... Yeah, cool. And then the water gets hotter and hotter, and the frog doesn't notice the fact that the water keeps getting hotter because it's very slowly acclimating itself to this hot water. And so all of a sudden, the water gets so hot that the frog succumbs to the heat and dies. Right? 
And it's this very gentle progression that the frog never notices is happening. And so too is, is some of the effects that, that pornography has had on our community. When we look at the way that, that sexuality is portrayed in movies, in music, right, in magazines, you look at how easy it is to grab a magazine that's, that's just like sitting right there on the shelf. It's not, it's not, you know, guarded or hidden or, you know, tucked away with a cover on or anything like that. But you look at magazines like Maxim and, and Cosmopolitan, right? Um, these magazines, which are, which are aimed specifically at young people, are, are pushing the envelope further and further and further to, to introduce more and more sexuality and really to normalize and say, no, no, it's okay. Like sexuality, like there's, you can expose more and more of yourself. That's just fine, right? We ended up with things like there's this gradual progression in like fashion where suddenly a couple years ago, I don't know if you remember this, where like the side boob became like a thing, right? It's like, how did we get to this point in our culture where like it's okay to like just show off the side of a person's boob, right? We got to a certain point in our culture just recently where men decided they could start wearing rompers. Well, how did this happen? I don't know that that's necessarily a sexual thing, but it's certainly a weird thing. Um, and one of the things that people find with, with pornography is, is that you end up in, this, in this, uh, this mode where you become desensitized to things, right? And, and there's a whole neurological kind of explanation for this, but, but it's, it's similar if you've, if you've not struggled with pornography before. Let me illustrate something for you, right? You ever notice that when you're flipping through like Instagram, right? or you're just flipping through like pictures on, on Facebook or posts or something like that, right? Or, or, or whatever your social media feed is. Like I watch, I watch my teens, I'm not on Snapchat because it scares me. Um, but when I see like my teens use Snapchat, right? In my youth group, they fly through photos. I mean, it's like, how are you possibly taking in the image that you're, that you're looking at? You're not. It's like, tick -tick 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 -tick, like swipe left, right, right. The speed with which people can peruse things, right, is because we, as a culture, have gotten into this into this ability to just kind of skim through. We're lo we're looking like very very basically at what's in front of us, but we're not looking deeply at what's in front of us. And there are neurological and and there are chemical things that happen in our brains that that kind of explain this. But as a culture, we've gotten to the point where there's just a disposable amount of information that keeps coming at us. You can take down the rompers. I'm not sure they're <laughs> super critical right now. Um, but as we go through, the, the value, we don't realize that what we're looking at are, are people. We don't take a moment to pause and recognize that what we're looking at are, are people who are going through different points in life. And obviously, a lot of us, the way that we portray our lives on, on social media, the way that we look at things is like, this is me, the best version of me, right? But very often, you'll see things where somebody is expressing something that is very much not the best version of them. It's a moment where they're, they're asking for help. It's a moment where they're sharing something that's sad, something that, that, that requires some reflection. Something where, where you put that out into the world and you kind of hope that the world will recognize it and savor it and look at it for more than just a split second, but in a culture that is extremely um, transient, in a culture that's extremely just fast-paced, we don't spend the time to actually look at who we're liking, at what we're looking at. And I think pornography plays into this in a, in a really kind of particular way. Um, To understand just how widespread the use of pornography is, I've got a couple statistics. I know Paul Kim um, showed a few statistics which were really good. But um, I went to the, the website and just the, the statistics page um, from, it's the largest, if not the largest, it's one of the largest pornography websites on the web. And, and praise be to God, you can go to their statistics page without seeing anyone naked, which is lovely. Um, 
but they update as like kind of like this great study in, in data analysis every year. They show you uh, a whole breakdown of all of the use of pornography across this one particular website. So on this one website, um, in 2016, right, so the last year that they have data for, in 2016, people watched 4 billion 599 million hours of pornography. 4 billion, 4.6 billion hours of pornography were watched, right? That time equals 500,000 years. 500, a half a million years were swept up last year. Now, can you imagine if we took 500 million years worth of people's time and energy and attention and put it towards something important like figuring out cancer or whatever? Like, what could we accomplish as a, as a community, as a society, if we, took, if we took half a million years worth of time and energy? Further, the number of videos that we're seeing, right, was um, 91 billion 980,225,000 videos were viewed in 2016. Almost 92 billion videos in 2016. And this is from one porn website. This is not all pornography on the web. This is just one location. That is crazy. They said if you took all of the data that was used every hour Every hour, the data, and you put it all on thumb drives, on like 16 gig thumb drives, it would extend from Earth all the way up to the moon, and then it would wrap around the moon. One hour. That's how much porn is being consumed. And, and a lot of people think, oh, this is just like a guy issue, right? This is a, an issue that men deal with. It's not really a thing that, that women struggle with. And that's not true. And, and if you listen to the Integrity Restored podcast, um, their team does a really great job of interviewing a lot of women and inviting them to kind of share their story. And the thing that they hear over and over and over again is that women say, you know, like just like this morning when you get your men's and women's session, right? So many women said, I sat in my women's session and they told me that I was a beautiful daughter of Christ, right? And that one day there would, you know, like if God is calling us to marriage, you'll meet this, this man and, and like just these wonderful things. But we never once address the topics of, of pornography and masturbation. And girls that have grown up in, in the church and in, in youth events and things like that that have never heard the fact that, that, that other women struggle with this, they felt completely alone. Whereas when you look at men, right, if you go to a men's talk, it's like, hey, gentlemen, knock off the porn. Right? It's, it's, it's like a much broader application of like, well, this is something that we understand is a men's issue, but it's not just a men's issue. And there's a, a, a Catholic artist um, named Audrey Assad who speaks really eloquently about her experience with pornography. And she says, she says I always felt uh, like men, if, if you felt like the guilt and the shame and, and the hurt of being in, uh, you know, using pornography, for men, it was like you were in prison but you were in prison with like loads of people, right? It was like this giant prison where there was like a, a yard and you could go lift weights and you know, there was like camaraderie. She said, when you're a young woman who's looking at pornography and you're struggling with this and you never hear the fact that there are other women who deal with this and who are struggling with this temptation, you feel like you are in prison and in solitary confinement and that there is absolutely no one else around you who shares in that experience. And the data just doesn't bear this out. From, from this website's own um, statistics, from Pornhub, 21% uh, of their users are women. 21%, that's one in five users is a woman. 63% of men um, engage pornography multiple times a week. 21% of women engage pornography multiple times a week. This is not an issue that just affects men. This is something that affects both men and women. I'd like to invite um, one of our great speakers, Katie Hartfeld, up here. She's gonna introduce um, a wonderful witness that we have. So everybody give a round of applause for Katie. So just, just real briefly, 
Um, I am so extremely honored and excited to introduce this video of a young woman that is extremely near and dear to my heart. I first met Cecilia when she was in sixth grade in my youth program when I was a youth minister and I had her all the way through high school. Incredibly um, filled with joy and love and really active in our youth program, but all the while had this secret and this um, struggle that she was harboring and keeping from everyone else. And so the reason why I'm so excited to share this with you today is because she is proof that God can and will bring a greater good out of every evil when we allow him. And she is a close friend of mine now. She's a missionary um, out of college. And so with that, I would like to introduce to you Cecilia's story. <laughs> My name is Cecilia War, and I am a beloved daughter of God. Why do I start there? I start there because in our society, it's really easy to identify ourselves with the things that we like or the things that we dislike or the things that we struggle with. So for example, I could say, hi, I'm Cecilia War, and I am a shopper. I love to shop. Or I'm a reader. I love to read. But really, that's not my inherent identity. My fundamental identity is as a child of God. And as a child of God, I struggled with pornography and masturbation for 10 long years. It started when I was nine years old and a friend of mine and I stumbled upon pornography um, when we were over at our house for a play date. We did not plan on this happening, um, but that day started a very shameful secret struggle. And neither one of us really had the vocabulary to deal with what we were experiencing. We didn't know the word pornography, we didn't know the word masturbation. Um, and so this really um, entrapped us and we didn't have the tools to break free. And I went to youth group um, some years later and once a year the boys got taken off for their version of the chastity talk and we, the women, got taken off to our version of the chastity talk. Um, and the guys would hear about pornography um, and the ways to break free if that was something they struggled with or just things to look out for. Um, and the women, we talk about relationships. And so as a young girl, I'm thinking, well, I'm not in a relationship with anyone, and I'm the only girl in the world who's struggling with this, and I can't tell anyone. And so this really continued that shame and that secrecy um, until I was about 17 years old, and I took a leap of courage, and I didn't want to be entrapped by this anymore, and so I went to confession. Um, and I was expecting the priest to look at me when I said the word pornography and say, get out. You are not loved, you are not forgiven, and you are the only girl who's ever done this before. But instead, the priest looked at me with love and said, I am so proud of you. And I'm so sorry for what you've gone through. And Jesus loves you and he forgives you and you are made clean. And as he said those words of absolution, I was made clean. And I wish I could tell you that that was the last time I ever looked at pornography and I was healed that day and it's just as easy as that. Um, and unfortunately, that's not the case. It continued to be a struggle. But there were some things that I did that really helped me in my fight for freedom. Um, so the first thing was I became a reconciliation-aholic. And I tried as hard as I could within 24 hours of falling to getting myself in front of a priest in confession. Um, and I found that when I went that quickly, it made it a lot harder to justify falling to the sin of pornography or masturbation again. The second thing that I did was I got myself in front of our Lord in the Eucharist as often as possible. So that was daily mass, as often as I could make it, um, and also getting in front of the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament in perpetual adoration. Um, that priest shared with me that when we are trying to free ourselves from a visual sin like pornography, um, we have to retrain our eyes. We have to give ourselves good images. And so sitting in front of my Lord and having that be the image in my head um, really helped me to keep command of my thoughts and not just command of my actions. The other thing that I did is I started a day counter on my phone. Um, and so I would, every time I fell, I'd have to set it back to zero. Um, and after a while, it got really hard to set it back to zero when I'd been doing really well. Um, and so it became a, I'm not going to be, I don't have to do this forever. 
but I just have to make it one more day. I've made it two days, I can make it three. Okay, I've made it a week, I can make it two weeks. And pretty soon that day counter got so large that I didn't want to set it back to zero. Um, and so today it's been 1,465 days since the last time I confessed the sin of pornography. Um, the Victory app, which I didn't have when I was your age, um, has this feature built in. And so I strongly encourage the Victory app um, to help you on your road to freedom. And I just want to tell you, as your sister in Christ, that freedom is so possible. That you are a beloved child of God. That Jesus Christ died for your sins. That he wants to make you clean. And he's going to help you do it. My name is Cecilia Ward, and I am a beloved child of God, and so are you. In, um, in 1870, there was an entomologist uh, who wanted to bring this special kind of moth over to the United States, uh, the gypsy moth, so that they could create silk, right? And what he did was he, he brought it over from, from Europe into Boston, right? And uh, introduced this moth and started breeding them, right? They got out and they started just flourishing around and there were no natural predators for these moths, right? And they started multiplying extremely rapidly. And they ended up within short order overtaking massive amounts of forests and killing huge amounts of trees. In the 1960s, scientists thought that they had kind of figured out a way to maybe get these moths back under control. And what they did was they realized that the moths, in order to reproduce, they would smell for a pheromone in the female moths, right? The male moths would smell for this particular scent that uh, the female moth would, would put off. And the scientists developed a fake version of that pheromone. And they took this fake version of the pheromone and they started just spreading it all over the forest. In, in New England and up in the Northeast, right? And what happened was that those moths, those male moths, became so addicted to that pheromone, right, that when mating season came, they couldn't tell the difference between the fake pheromone and the real pheromone. What's worse is that they, the pheromone that they had produced was so potent Right? And it was like this concentrated, wonderful version of this pheromone. It was so potent that an actual female moth, when compared to the pheromone, like this fake synthetic pheromone, was wildly unattractive. And so because they had using, using a fake version of the sexual attraction, all of these male moths stopped reproducing. The population of moths plummeted. And, and everything kind of came back into order. And the same thing happens with pornography. When we are exposed to pornography, we are seeing this synthesized fake version of sex, right? And just like Paul Kim noted uh, that when, when that happens, there are three chemicals that get released in our brain, right? We see an image, we see some sort of version of, of pornography that comes up on our, on our screen, right? And we release dopamine, we release adrenaline, and we uh, release serotonin. These are the same chemicals that are used, as we saw earlier, in, in drugs, the same things that, that get triggered when, uh, when we experience like extreme amounts of joy, extreme amounts of sadness, extreme amounts of, of, um, of pain and happiness, right? These anchor things, these pleasure moments, every one of those moments releases some of these chemicals in our, in our mind. And it does so because these are particular moments that our brain is trained to come back to and remember, right? And the more often we view these images that, that create these moments of, of momentary pleasure, the more times our brain fires and it starts to remember this correlation between that image and the dopamine release and, and the feeling of, of a momentary joy, right? And it's just like, have you ever been hiking uh, on a path in a forest, right? If you find a path that is, is, you know, a brand new path and you walk through it, like it, you might be able to kind of tell where the path is if, if a few people walk it, you know, every month or every week. Um, for paths that are traveled, you know, thousands of times a day, you know how much easier it is to see that path? Well, it's huge, right? 
Like there's no, there's no trees growing over it. There's no brush growing down the middle. Everything's been trampled down. It's this massive like path that you can just walk down very, very easily. And the same thing happens in our brain. The more often we wire our brain and we tell it, hey brain, when I see an image of, of pornography, I want you to fire that dopamine. It starts to create a path that gets traveled more and more and more and more and more. And then suddenly we have rewired the way that our brain works. So that when we compare the experience of pornography to the experience of an actual relationship, right, and a real human, suddenly this, the real human, is not nearly as enticing as the image of pornography. And I can tell you this is a real thing. I remember when I was shocked when, when I got to college and uh, in my first month at school, they would, would write it in the paper, there were five people who had gotten... Um, who would, they had like raids on their dorm rooms and they came in because they had illegal pornography. Like they had, they had either underage pornography or something that was so, uh, you know, it, was, it, in, it involved uh, human trafficking, videos of, of people who had been involved in human trafficking. Like these crazy things. And I'm like, dude, these are, these are like freshmen at college with me. How do you get to the point in your life where you are, are, are looking at, at Stuff that's that intense. And I'd hear stories about people saying like, oh yeah, dude, you should, like this guy has like some really, really, really gnarly porn. Like, oh, how do you get there? And in being a youth minister and walking with people, I found out that, that, that people don't get there just all of a sudden. It's not like there's like a total weirdo and there's like, hey, this is what I like. No, it's a gradual progression that happens over time. And the more we expose ourselves to it, the more we need something more and more aggressive in order to fulfill that need to get that same release. It's this really, really vicious cycle, and not to mention the spiritual impact that comes from that, right? You have this momentary sense of satisfaction, which is followed by an absolute drop, and this feeling of, of guilt and shame and hurt, and, and you, you, know, you know that this is not the right thing to do, right? And, but then suddenly you need to, to refill that, that desire and so you go back to the porn, right? Because it's going gonna, it's gonna to make you feel good for a few more moments. And so you go back to it. But now you need something that's a little bit harder, right? And a little bit like kind of more crazy. And so you, you watch for a little bit longer. Suddenly you're, you're like putting off your friends. And you're like, oh, I don't think I'm going to go out tonight. I'm just going to hang out in my room and just. And this cycle gets really, really dangerous. And really, really harmful. And it's harmful to you. It's harmful to, to the people around you. It could be harmful to your education. It could be harmful to, to your future spouse. If, if, it can be harmful to the church. If you're called to a vocation to, to religious life, right, but, but you're, you're spending so much of your time sucked in to this vicious cycle, right, that you're not serving your future bride. If you're called to marriage, you're not serving your future spouse by sitting there and getting sucked into this synthetic fake version of sexuality. It's not how we are created. It's looking at, at a very, very shallow version of what we are and what sexuality is. Behold, behold, I make all things new. Behold, I make all things new. I don't know if you are trapped in this vicious cycle. I don't know if you are stuck in this sin. But behold, our Lord makes all things new. That is a promise and a guarantee. And it is offered for you. And it is available to you. And it can start today. It can start tonight. It can start this afternoon. As soon as we get out of here, you can go to confession. You can go and you can start new. Behold, our God makes all things new. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's a beautiful thing. That is a wonderful thing. That is what we are called to. We are called to elevate ourselves out of this trap. Most people, you know the average age of exposure for pornography is 12 years old, at least for little boys. 12 years old. When you're 12 years old, it's, it's, generally it's not your fault that you've ended up exposed to pornography. Right? I know eight-year-olds, seven-year-olds, little kids that have been found watching pornography. It's not their fault that they get sucked into this. We are in a culture and a society that constantly tells us that, that sexuality is good, and, go, and, it, and it is good. But abusing our sexuality is not. It's harmful. Do not be a slave to this. 
There is relief and there is hope and there is joy waiting for you. Behold, our God makes all things new. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, we've got a, a number of different ways that we would like to offer you um, help. Matthew 8. When Jesus came down from the mountains, great crowds followed him. And then a leper approached, paid him homage, and said, Lord, if you wish, you can make me clean. Jesus stretched out his hand, touched him, and said, I will do it. Be made clean. His leprosy was cleansed immediately. Brothers and sisters, we are called, we are called to elevate our souls and elevate our minds. We are called to, to, to be new creations. But we are not challenged to do this alone. There are a whole series of apps, of, of resources, of books, and of a community that are here and ready and willing to reach out and help you in your struggle because you are not alone. We've got um, an app that has been worked and developed uh, between, between Life Teen and the Franciscan University of Steubenville, and we're gonna show you a little video about that app. It's a great resource to enable you to start to fight against this drug, pornography. One of the hardest parts about being a youth minister for me is when a teen or young adult comes to me and says, Mark, I really want to change this part of my life, but I don't know how. I want to break free from, from pornography, from sexual sin, from temptation, whatever, but I don't know how. What do I do next? And that's why a couple years ago, I got together with my good friend Matt Frad and our team at Life Team. We created something new called the Victory app. It's available on Android or iPhone. You can download it for free. And in the Victory app, you'll find readings and writings that will help you to go deeper in your prayer life, help you to overcome these temptations, to resist them. You're going to find daily trackers and, and, and elements that will help you see where you're most likely, when you're most likely to fall into this, to, to, to seek it out. So you can start to learn about yourself, what these triggers are, and help your soul lead your body instead of vice versa. There's even a built-in piece on the app where if your friend downloads it, also, again, for free, you can press one button and send a prayer request, a push notification right to your friend's phone. You know, I need help right now. I need prayer right now. That's what it will say. Totally anonymous, but, but totally legit. This is the kind of accountability that you're going to need to move forward. The kind of friends and accountability you're going to need to finally be victorious in this battle. But that's not all. That we at Life Teen and the Youth Outreach Office at Franciscan University of Steubenville, we got together and we said, what else can we give all these young people this summer? And that's why we created a new website, leaveporn.com. And if you go there, you'll be able to find the Victory app, but you'll also find a ton of videos and blogs, things that will help you in your daily walk as you move forward from this conference weekend. We are with you, we are behind you, and we believe in you. You can be victorious in this battle. Do not give in. Strive for holiness. God bless you. You know, um, yeah, you we, uh, by virtue of who God is, you know, we just celebrated um, the Trinity um, at Mass. And God in his very nature is creative, right? And, and we as, as members of the body of Christ and as, as reflections of a God who is creative and love is creative and happens in community, uh, we are called to create. And the way that we create, the way that we express that love of God is through our sexuality, right? Through bringing life into the church. Um, sex is good. We were made for love, by love, in order to love. That is who we are and that is what we are made for. True love says, this is my body given up for you. The pornified culture, the culture that we live in says, this is your body taken by me. Look at the contrast between those two things. One is sacrificial love, love that lays down its heart and its life for the good of this other person. Lays down sacrificially their love so that new life can become new and can come into the world. The opposing view is a complete take. This is your body taken by me for me to use. 
I think if we're honest with ourselves, we'll recognize that the love that satisfies, that genuinely satisfies, not just our temporal momentary urges and need, but this, the love that satisfies, satisfies deep in our heart, the love that we would be proud to share with our community, the love that enables us to stand in front of a community and lay down our lives for a spouse or for our church in our vocation, that kind of love is the love that is selfless, is a love that sacrifices, is a love that is called to be new, is a love that is called and elevates the body of Christ and lifts up our entire community. That is the love that we are called to. Strong marriages, holy vocations. We are called to this love. Let your love not be selfish but let your love be selfless. If that means you need to lay down some temptations in your life, lay them down. If that means that you need to lay down certain habits and tendencies, if that means that you need to delete certain apps on your phone, delete them. If that means that you need to, to take your phone and not let it be in your room, right? If that means that when you know that your parents are leaving and everybody's gonna be out of the house, if that means that you get on your bike and you go for a bike ride, like go for that bike ride, man. Do it for the kingdom of God. Praise him. Praise the Jesus, right? Like, get out and do what you need to do. If you need to take your phone and put it in a bag and hand it to your friend and be like, here, you take this for the next, until I'm 18 or 20 or 40, whatever. Do that. There are tremendous, let's put the screen back up of resources. There are tremendous resources available to you. I was shocked. Last year, I gave the talk on um, same-sex attraction, and I was looking for great resources to find, and, and it was, it was, there were a number of resources, but, but when I sat down to give this talk, I found that there are amazing, amazing resources available to us. Uh, know that help is out there. Know that this is not just a religious thing, that this is a community thing. There are, are scientists and community members from way outside the walls of the church who are very interested in helping with this. There are states who are passing laws making this a, a public health crisis. And they are saying the use of pornography is, is a crisis in our communities. I want you to know that you are not alone, and I want you to know that the church stands boldly by your side and is offering you help and the grace that comes through God's forgiveness. Behold, he makes all things new. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Holy Spirit, would you move in our hearts. May the, holiness, um, may the holiness and grace that you pour out so easily into our hearts just fill us and enable us to overcome the temptations we have. May we be strong brothers and sisters to help those around us who are struggling. And for those of us who do not feel these temptations, let us be beacons of help and let us be companions on the journey for those who need our help. Let us reach out and be edified and strengthened in you. And always elevate us, make us new. In Jesus' name we pray, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God bless you guys.